Hi there, everyone, and welcome to the last pre-recorded lecture for Chapter 10 in your pharmacology class. This chapter is going to cover medications that are commonly used in the surgical environment. And I know there's been some questions regarding what do I need to keep in my brain? So I just want to reiterate a couple things before we dig into the information in this chapter. And the first thing is, it's all important. Uh, I think that we always need the with them, the what's in it for me, right? And I think if we always look at what we're learning from the perspective of quality patient care, everybody that is in the operating room, um, interacting with that patient and providing patient care needs to have an overall understanding of everything that is going on in the operating room. So as a patient advocate and as those extra eyes and ears, I think for me, that's the with them. What's in it for me? Good patient care. Now, if you want a little bit more guidance of what is specifically going to be on the NBSTSA uh, certification exam, go ahead and go to the NBSTSA website. That is nbstsa.org. And if you poke around in there, you can find the, um, the test outline for the certification. And uh, it will break down all of the areas that you're tested on, how many questions are in that area, and which topics will be covered. Uh, lastly, the medications that are commonly used in the surgical environment, this is going to be something you definitely want to hold on to, right? Because this is the common stuff that is going to be used. So having said that, without further ado, let's get into the chapter. Now, remember in chapter three, you heard about different types of drug nomenclature. There were three types of nomenclature. I think maybe Mrs. Stolp gave that lecture. Um, and then, uh, the main classifications of medications were also discussed. So let's just review those quickly. What are the four main classifications? The first one is the principal action. Now the principal action is the main thing that this drug was designed to do, okay? Um, it is determined by the chemicals that were used in the preparation of the drug. And so sometimes because of that, it's referred to as chemical action. Okay, principal action, chemical action, those are synonymous. The second thing is body systems that are affected. Many drugs are classified by uh, the tissues, organs, or cells that they target. Okay, so what body systems are affected? Is it a neurological drug? Is it supposed to target the liver, the pancreas? Okay, what system is affected? The next one is the physiological action. Um, the physiological action is uh, looked at as the change uh, of the function of the body. Um, okay, so drugs that change the function are considered, um, we, we call those physiological action um, classification. And then the last one, therapeutic action. So these drugs are classified according to their benefits. All right. Do they um, lift the mood? Do they help us to sleep? Those kinds of things. Do they provide pain relief? So moving forward from here, we're going to talk about each of the classifications and subclassifications of commonly used medications in the operating room. Um, keep in mind that some of the drugs may have more than one classification. So the first uh, classification that we're going to talk about is amnesics. 
and amnesics are typically given prior to surgery, usually in the pre-op area. Uh, it's kind of like the little cocktail, uh, a little margarita in the IV, if you will, that patients are going to get in the preoperative area. And this is going to help calm their nerves. And it has a amnesia type effect. So um, a lot of patients, when they, they get this in pre-op and they roll into the operating room and they say, oh, last time I was in the operating room, I don't, I don't remember any of this. And, you know, our common response is, well, you probably won't remember any of this either. So the job of an amnesic, again, is to induce temporary memory loss. And an example of a common one used in surgery is midazolam. And the trade name for midazolam is Versed. Next on our list are analgesics and antipyretics. Now, analgesics are used to uh, eliminate or reduce pain, and antipyretics are used to uh, reduce or eliminate fever. And uh, so a lot of times one drug can handle both. And there are uh, several strengths. They can be over the counter, they can be uh, prescription, and they can be narcotics as well. And there are three different categories, salicylates, uh, which are aspirins, uh, acetaminophen, and NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Some other terms that uh, may be used to describe these types of medications are febrifuge, antithermic, and antifebrile. Next on our list is anesthesia agents. Uh, the uh, content of the chapter focuses on local and topical anesthetics and doesn't include anything about general anesthetics. Uh, so just to review, the term anesthesia refers to lack of sensation. And the majority of these Medications in this category are referred to as nerve conduction blocking agents. And so what that means is the, sen the pain sensation that is generated at the surgical site uh, causes uh, nerve impulses regarding that pain to be sent to the brain. And so these agents are designed to block those signals. Uh, from getting to the brain. And so that's how they help with pain. And their goal is to help manage pain uh, intraoperatively and postoperatively. And there's a couple different flavors that we're going to talk about, amino amides and amino esters. And then we'll talk about a couple additives or uh, agonists, really, that are commonly used in anesthesia agents. Uh, so uh, remember the red coloring on the label. You can see this image that I put here of 2% lidocaine with epinephrine. Uh, they're, uh, when they're using anesthesia agents, they may either have epi or they may not have epi. But if they do, that is indicated by the red color on the bottle. And you can see that this one not only has it on the label, but also has it on the plastic little cap as well. Um, and then it has that one to 200,000 uh, ratio on there as well. That's important for us to put on our label and notate. So uh, amino amides. Now, when we're talking about amino amides, these are the anesthesia agents that are processed in the liver, and they're uh, then excreted uh, through the urine. Okay, so uh, the problem is that this could potentially cause toxicity if we have an individual that has impaired liver function. And if you look on page 10-1, there are some examples listed, um, some of those being local uh, anesthetics as well as regional and topical anesthetics. There's bupivacaine that is listed there. 
Um, also, um, atidocaine, lidocaine, and mepivacaine. All right. So, if you, you suffice it to say, if you are taking an exam and you see something that ends in a cane, C A I N E, you're pretty safe to bet that it is some sort of anesthetic agent. Uh, the table on page 120 also goes over the onset of action and the duration of the action and then the maximum or toxic dose for adults. Now, um, aside from amino amides, another subcategory of anesthesia agents is amino esters. And amino esters are transformed in the blood uh, by a neurotransmitter or by an enzyme, excuse me, called pseudocholinesterase. And pseudocholinesterase, its job is to actually uh, break down the neurotrans, the, um, the anesthetic uh, blocking agent. Um, and so uh, there is a condition called pseudocholinesterase deficiency, uh, which if a patient has this, then um, they do not have enough pseudocholinesterase to break down the medication that is blocking those signals. And sometimes it can be hours and hours before a patient is able to come out from underneath anesthesia. Um, so uh, like I said, the um, amino esters are biotransformed in the plasma. And um, if you look back on page 120 again on table 10-2, uh, it gives a list of some different types of amino esters like benzocaine, chloroprocaine, cocaine, procaine, and tetracaine. Again, there's that C-A-I-N-E. Uh, bringing us to the uh, awareness that this is some sort of anesthetic agent. Um, now, when we are talking about different agonists that are used in conjunction with these anesthesia agents, uh, there's two most common ones. One is the epinephrine that we've already touched on, and then the other one is high, uh, high alluronidase. Okay, and we already uh, have talked a little bit about epi, but what is the significance of epinephrine? Epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor. So when the, um, the anesthetic is injected into the tissue, it's going to cause the vessels at that site to constrict down. And that helps us uh, in a couple of ways. One way that it helps us is that it it prolongs the uh, lasting power of the anesthetic agent in that localized area. You might hear us refer to lidocaine or sensorcaine, bupivacaine, whatever, as a local anesthetic. And so epi helps to keep the anesthetic localized. Otherwise, it's going to be picked up into the bloodstream really quickly and carried away and then they're gonna to have to keep giving more and more and more local anesthetics. So epi helps by um, causing vasoconstriction. Um, so it helps to retain and localize the anesthetic, but it also helps to reduce bleeding, right? Because if the vessels are constricted down, then they're not gonna be bleeding as much. So that is really helpful for us during surgery. Um, there are situations where physicians will avoid using epinephrine, and these are some things that you need to tuck away in the back of your mind as the patient advocate. Um, children, children, um, small children, uh, and individuals that have some sort of situation like hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, vascular compromise, um, they should not have epi injected at that site uh, if that's a concern at the surgical site. The other consideration is, um, and there's a little rhyme in here to help us remember, 
Uh, we typically want to avoid using epinephrine in the uh, fingers, toes, penis, nose. All right, now that doesn't mean that the surgeon's never going to use it, but you need to have an awareness. And if you are doing hands or feet or groin or um, something with the nose, and the nurse is giving you something with epinephrine, you just want to ask the question, like, um, you know, is this okay? Um, I, you know, I thought I remembered that it's contraindicated in fingers, toes, penis, nose, that kind of thing, right? Be the advocate for the patient, okay? And uh, then the hyaluronidase actually helps with diffusion. So here we're talking about penetrating those denser tissues like connective tissues. Um, and so that, therefore, it's going to enhance and prolong the effect of that agent. All right, next on our list is anticoagulants and fibrinolytics. Now, anticoagulants are medications that prevent blood clotting. So any anticoagulant is going to interfere with or prevent blood clotting or the coagulation process. And fibrin is a major component in the clotting process. So fibrinolytics destroy fibrin, which then prevents blood from clotting. Um, there are several examples. Uh, heparin and warfarin are two really common ones that deter blood clots from forming. And they are also uh, considered fibrinolytics. There's also the TPA or tissue plasminogen activator, right, that um, can be given within a short amount of time if someone has had a stroke or something like that, and it will help to break apart that clot. So um, where some fibrinolytics um, or anticoagulants prevent blood from clotting, others uh, help to, to destroy the clot after it has occurred. And uh, heparin is a really common one that we will use in the operating room during vascular procedures. Now, when you're doing vascular procedures, I just have to get up on my soapbox for a second and just reiterate how important labeling is. I had a student way in my past that was at a clinical site. They were doing a vascular case. He was setting up for it. His preceptor um, was not scrubbed in. He was just kind of running and getting things and the nurse was giving the medications to the student. Well, the student accidentally mixed up the labels for the lidocaine and the heparin. All right, so that got him dismissed from his site. Um, so just be very careful because um, even uh, more so in vascular procedures, you have several clear fluids on your field at the same time. You could have heparin, which is an anticoagulant, thrombin, which is a coagulant, the lidocaine. Uh, you could have saline as well uh, as other things. So extremely important to make sure that we're, we're labeling these guys correctly. And then here on the label, you can see that the heparin does also have units um, of measurement associated with it. It says 300,000 um, per 30 mLs, which um, we know from our math class that that um, ratio can be reduced to 1,000 units of heparin per ml. And that's something that we definitely want to notate on our label. Anticonvulsants are those medications that are used to prevent a seizure, a seizure or reduce the effects of a seizure. Uh, a seizure is when there is abnormal electrical activity in the brain. And because epilepsy is a common um, condition associated with seizures, um, these medications are also referred to as anti-epileptics. And there's a couple examples here, the Dilantin and the Versed. 
Now on to antiemetics. Antiemetics help to reduce nausea and vomiting, which is a very common uh, occurrence uh, post op. So they're used to treat the, those side effects of the general anesthesia or the different analgesics that may have been um, given intraoperatively. They can also be used, um, you know, to treat nausea that uh, is a result of chemotherapy as well as motion sickness. Um, there is a little patch that sometimes they use if you tell them, uh, the anesthesia care provider, that you know you typically have nausea and vomiting post-op, they might put on um, a patch. It's called a scopolamine patch. It kind of works like Dramamine, um, and it like infuses through the skin um, and can help with post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, some examples um, of uh, antiemetics, again, um, our midazolam is on the list. I'm looking in table 10-3. Um, there's a whole list of things there. There's the scopolamine that I mentioned. Um, there, Finnergan is another one that's common. Versed, uh, medical, mar mar medical marijuana also made the list there. Um, and then there are some holistic um, things that can be used like acupuncture, hypnosis, peppermint, ginger, um, those kinds of things. All right, antihistamines. Antihistamines um, are usually used to, to treat some sort of um, a reaction to an allergy and that allergy could be pollen, food, medication, some sort of bite or sting uh, from an insect or an animal. And uh, when there is a histamine reaction, that causes dilation at uh, the site of injury and that increases the permeability of blood vessels, which typically leads to the symptoms, whether it's sneezing, itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, swelling, pain, heat, uh, uh, inflammation starts to occur at the site, um, all kinds of fun things like that. Um, a uh, severe example of a histamine reaction is anaphylaxis, and we talked about that before, but anaphylaxis can lead to death. And uh, so antihistamines are used to prevent or uh, control, reduce these histamine reactions. And uh, a really good example that we probably have all heard of is Benadryl. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about anti-infective agents. And I think as we go through here, you'll find that a lot of the anti-infective agents that we're going to talk about are really familiar if you kind of dig back in your brain to when we uh, had our microbiology class and we talked about antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral agents as we kind of went through and talked about those microorganisms. So the job of the anti-infective agent is to kill microorganisms or pathogens. Remember, pathogens are any microorganisms that cause disease. So it's uh, the job of the anti-infective to kill those pathogens or hinder their growth um, and they use different mechanisms to disrupt the growth of those pathogens. And so we'll talk about that. And uh, they are grouped according to their action and their use. And so we're going to go over those on the next couple slides. So first off, let's talk about the beta-lactams. Beta-lactams are a group of antibacterial agents that include penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and others. Um, they are not effective against resting bacteria, but uh, work by inhibiting the enzymes necessary for them to uh, manufacture the cell wall. So if they can't manufacture the cell wall or they can't maintain the cell wall, then they're going to break 
uh, and they're not going to function. So penicillin is um, the natural or semi-synthetic substance that's derived from penicillin, uh, penicillium molds. Remember, we talked about that in microbiology. And uh, so the penicillin group is divided into four uh, sub-classifications. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about those. Um, ampicillin uh, is a, or ampicillin-like drugs are effective against uh, some gram-negative bacilli. Uh, microorganisms and include ampicillin and amoxicillin, which probably most of you have heard of. Those are pretty common. There are other broad spectrum penicillins that are kind of more like an umbrella um, antibiotic, and those are most effective against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Like um, some examples of those are the carbenicillin and the piperacillin and the ticarcillin. Penicillin G, like drugs, is the third category of penicillins, and they're primarily effective against uh, most gram-positive bacteria and a couple gram-negative bacteria. And some examples of those are penicillin G and penicillin V. And the last one is penicillinase resistant penicillins. So penicillinase, penicillinase is an enzyme that is produced by certain bacteria that make bacteria resistant to penicillins. So penicillinase resistant penicillins are effective against um, bacterial strains that are more resistant, such as the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, and also Staph pneumonia as well. And some of those are um, diclo, um, dicloxacillin and oxacillin. And uh, so that is the um, the different categories of penicillin. And we also have the cephalosporins that are in the beta-lactams category. And cephalosporins are divided into a few subcategories as well. Um, the first one that the book talks about is called first-generation cephalosporins, and they're primarily effective against gram-positive cocci. And ANCEF and or cephazolin and cephalexin are the two most common ones, and we use those a lot in surgery. And uh, it's interesting that these antibiotics typically come in a powder form in the vial, and then the nurse reconstitutes those with some sterile saline and shakes it up and then either draws it out and shoots it into your irrigation if you need antibiotic irrigation, or, or you could draw it up from the field as well. Um, so. Uh, cephazolin and cephalexin are a couple common ones, which are ANCEF and Keflex. Those are the first generation cephalosporins. And then there are second generation cephalosporins like cephotitan and cefoxetin um, that are effective against bacterioides. Remember when we talked about bacterioides in microbiology? Uh, the third generation cephalosporins are most effective against Haemophilus influenza and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa as well, and uh, Cefotoxim and uh, Ceftrioxone are a couple of the common ones there. And then we have a fourth generation of cephalosporin, which is most effective against gram-positive cocci and gram-negative bacilli. And uh, currently, there's only one fourth generation um, cephalosporin, and it is cefepime. Then uh, the fifth generation cephalosporin, uh, they primarily use to treat MRSA infections, and that's Zephtera. All right, um, so let's, uh, those are the beta-lactams, so let's move on to talking a little bit about the sulfonamides. A lot of times these are called sulfa drugs, um, 
And there are synthetic drugs and how they work is they disrupt the synthesis of folic acid and bacteria need this to produce their DNA and purine. So if they don't have the folic acid that they need, they can't make DNA, therefore they can't replicate. So that's how sulfa drugs work um, and they're effective against many gram positive and gram gram-negative bacteria, uh, bacteria. and uh, sulfa methoxazole is a common one, and sulfa cetamide is another common one. Um, sulfalazine is another one there. Now, polypeptides are often referred to as polymyxins, polymyxins, I guess, and um, they are produced by the organism Bacillus um, polymyxa, which is a gram-positive bacterium. And uh, the way that they work is they bind to the cell, the bacterial cell wall, and they disrupt its ability to release toxins. And polymyxin is a really common one um, that is a polypeptide that they use. Now, aminoglycosides were originally derived from bacteria in two groups, and you'll recognize this because we talked about this quite a bit in microbiology, a streptomyces. And uh, so streptomyces is a family uh, or is a bacteria, and there's been a whole bunch of antibiotics that we've used streptomyces for to develop antibiotics. And um, any of the anti-infective agents that end in M-I-C-I-N um, is from the streptomyces, um, or I'm sorry, the micromonospora family. And then any drugs that end with M-Y-C-I-N are from streptomyces family. And uh, so many of them are synthetic, but how they work is they interrupt the protein synthesis of the ribosomes. Remember, the ribosome's job is to read the copy of DNA, right? The RNA, so DNA gets copied inside the nucleus, it leaves the nucleus, it goes into the cytoplasm, and then the ribosomes, uh, ribosomal units are triggered uh, to come to the RNA and latch on and begin building those polypeptide chains. So aminoglycosides inhibit that process, all right? So then that means that the cells can't grow and replicate. It also means that they can't maintain their cell wall. And if they can't maintain their cell wall, then that causes lysis of the cell. Uh, these guys are uh, effective against gram-negative uh, bacilli, especially pseudomonas, and some facultative uh, anaerobic bacilli as well. Agentamycin and canamycin, neomycin, streptomycin, tobramycin, those are all really common, and we do use those in the operating room. Um, in, in my experience, uh, we use tobramycin in bone cement, if we had a patient that would come in and let's say they had a total joint replacement and they developed an infection in their joint, we would have to take out those implants. And in the place of where the implants were, we stick a block of cement. And before we mix up that cement, we fill it with a whole bunch of the powdered antibiotics and tobramycin was the, the, the drug of choice for the orthopedic surgeon that I worked with a lot. And um, then we would go ahead and just add the liquid portion to the cement, mix that up, and then they would stick it in, the, in place of the implants, sew the patient up, and uh, hope like heck that uh, cured the infection, right? So the antibiotic would actually leach out of the cement and hopefully, you know, um, because it's right there at the site of infection, right? Instead of orally or parenterally having to kind of work its way to the site of infection, it was right there at the site of infection. So hopefully it would, would take care of that. They could come back um, when the infection had been resolved and we could um, revise and do another uh, joint replacement for them. 
Another subcategory of anti-infective agents is tetracycline. And the tetracyclines are derived from um, actinobacteria. Remember us talking about that? That's also part of the streptomyces family. And the way that tetracyclines work is that they uh, disrupt protein synthesis of the cell and they make it impossible for the bacteria to reproduce. So they are effective against quite a few different gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, and there's several ways that they can um, be prescribed, uh, whether that's topical, oral, or parenteral. And some examples of tetracyclines are uh, tetracycline, um, uh, minocycline, and doxycycline. And uh, lastly, on this slide, we're going to talk about antifungals. There is one more subcategory, which is antimicrobials, but we will get into that on the next slide. Antifungals, again, um, are used to treat fungi, molds, and yeast. Uh, fungal infections, remember, are referred to as mycoses. And so these drugs are called antimycotics, right? They kill fungal infections. Um, and a lot of times they're made from mold or they're produced synthetically, and they can be topical, oral, or in parenteral forms as well. And there's three main uh, classifications of antifungals. There's the polyenes, and the polyenes are um, substances, they react with substances in the fungal cell membranes. And what they do is they render the cell unable to reproduce. Some examples of those are amphotericin and nystatin and primericin. The azoles are um, substances or anti-infective agents, agents that inhibit an enzyme necessary to the structure and function of the cell membrane. So again, they um, it, they make it difficult for the, um, the microorganism, the, the fungus, to maintain its cell membrane and then also perform essential internal functions, and so it can't grow and reproduce. And some uh, really uh, common one is diflucan or fluconazole, uh, it's a really common one um, that is used. And then uh, the last uh, type of antifungal is the eschenocandins, and these inhibit the synthesis of the fungal cell wall as well, and they disrupt that cycle so that they cannot grow or reproduce. And um, some of uh, the ones in that category are caspofungin, mycofungin, and anadula fungin. So our last subcategory of anti-infective agents are the antimicrobials. And uh, these should be familiar as well. There are three categories of antimicrobials that are used in the surgical setting, and those are antiseptics, disinfectants, and sterilants. So when we're talking about antiseptics, these are typically used on living tissue. So anytime we're doing a surgical scrub or prepping the patient, that's when an antiseptic would be used. And some examples of antiseptics are um, alcohol, chlorhexidine, gluconate, that CHG, um, iota-4, uh, chlorex, Silenol, the PCMX, remember that, um, and then the betadine or iodine, iota-4. So remember antiseptics, those are used on skin, scrub and prep. Now disinfectants and sterilants are both used on non-living tissue. Disinfectants are used on inanimate objects to destroy pathogens, and there's three different levels of disinfectants. There's low, intermediate, and high. Now, our low-level uh, low disinfectants are those that are going to be used on objects that come into contact with intact skin. 
Um, and so some, and we refer to these as non-critical items. Remember the Spalding classification system when we talked about low level, intermediate level, and, and, um, and high uh, classifications of um, items? And so low level items would be like the blood pressure cuff, the pulse ox, those kinds of things. Um, that would be, uh, we would be able to clean them with low level disinfectants like um, uh, isopropyl alcohol, bleach, or sodium hypochlorite, phenol, which is carbolic acid, um, iodophore, and uh, various quaternary ammonium compounds. Now, intermediate level disinfection, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back one second and just say about low level disinfectants kill most bacteria, but not spores, and they do not kill tuberculosis. Okay, um, now moving forward to intermediate level disinfectants, they kill most microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, viruses, and they kill tuberculosis and they're effective on hepatitis B viruses, but not bacterial spores. They don't kill bacterial spores. Um, so uh, intermediate level disinfectants can be used on um, intermediate or semi-critical items, such um, as those that come into contact with non-intact skin, uh, like the laryngoscope, right, for for placing the tube, um, the endotracheal tube. And so some examples of that could be an isopropyl alcohol, um, that 70 to 90% uh, concentration, um, bleach as well, phenyl, iodophore, and um, you know, it, it depends on uh, the concentration is what makes it an uh, intermediate level versus a low level concentration and contact time. All right, and then thirdly, high level disinfectants kill all microorganisms with the exception of spores and prions. Remember prions? Um, and uh, they're the ones that are going to come in contact with critical items. Um, such as those that contact tissue, okay? Um, two high-level disinfectants are glutaraldehyde and then a newer version of glutaraldehyde, the orthophalaldehyde, okay? And for, for these to render something sterile, they need to be soaked in very high concentrations of these disinfectants for a very long period of time, hours and hours, okay? And then lastly, what we're most familiar with probably is sterilants. Sterilants kill all microorganisms, including spores, all right? And some that we've already touched on uh, is the ETO or the ethylene oxide, hydrogen peroxide plasma, glutaraldehyde, parasitic acid, ozone, and then the most common and cost-effective sterilant would be the steam uh, sterilant uh, for steam sterilization. Antineoplastic agents are also referred to as chemotherapy agents or chemotherapy drugs, and so they are used to treat cancer. Um, neoplasm is a term that we often use, and it refers to new growth. And when talking about cancer, neoplasms are malignant. And so there are a variety of antineoplastic drugs, um, and they can be uh, come in topical, oral, and parenteral forms. And one thing that is really important, important for us in the operating room uh, is to know safe handling practices. Um, I know that uh, it's, chemotherapy agents are a little bit different than radioactive agents, but one thing that jumps to mind when we're talking about this is brachytherapy. And brachytherapy is a surgical procedure that is performed for individuals that have prostate cancer. And they 
take little radioactive seeds that are about the size of a little BB that would you know, be shot out of a BB gun, and they place them, they insert them into the prostate. And uh, so when we are dealing with these radioactive materials, we have to use a device called a Geiger counter to sweep the OR to uh, get a baseline reading of the level of radiation prior to and then after the procedure. And then we also need to make sure that we know how many seeds we start with and how many seeds we end with and how many seeds we used and where they were placed, of course. So um, safe handling of those medications is extremely important um, in regards to the transport, storage, and preparation, um, and also disposal. So that's an, those are important questions um, if you're in a situation where those things are being used intraoperatively to make sure that you know your facilities, policies, and procedures, and you follow those accordingly. Um, Antineoplastic drugs, there's several classifications of them, like I mentioned, and um, they are uh, divvied up according to their mechanism of action. And if you look at table 10-4, you'll see that there is a variety of classifications that they listed for you. And I just think it's so interesting to get a little glimpse of how these medications work. So alkylating agents are going to modify the DNA of the cancer cell, and uh, that is going to halt replication of the cell. Um, then there's also anti-androgen and anti-estrogen um, classifications that block the production of either estrogen or testosterone, which feed the, the um, cancer cells and help it to grow. Uh, so there is also antibiotic, um, antineoplastics that interfere with transcription because they inhibit certain enzymes from being produced um, from the, the transcribed RNA, from the DNA. Um, Antimetabolites interfere with the metabolism of the cell and uh, therefore interrupt production um, and so the uh, interfere with replication and growth. There are some that are also biological response modifiers, and so these are drugs that are going to enhance the effectiveness of the immune system. Mitotic inhibitors are going to do just what the, just what the, the name uh, implies. They are going to interfere with cell um, division, cellular division of the cancer cells. And then steroid hormones um, can uh, reduce hormone concentration to tumors depending on uh, the hormones for growth. Um, so the, the, this is an interesting chart. It kind of also breaks down the drug names and the types of cancer that are affected. All right, now you're going to have to dig back in your brains uh, way back to anatomy. I think it might have been the end of anatomy one. Um, and think about the autonomic nervous system. Remember, autonomic means involuntary. And the autonomic nervous system, or the ANS, is part of our central nervous system, the CNS. And autonomic agents um, are those that um, affect the autonomic or involuntary portion of the central nervous system. So these uh, organs that are involved in uh, autonomic nervous system are the various glands of our body, the heart, smooth muscle of the blood vessels, and hollow viscera like our intestine and our stomach and esophagus and all of those things. Um, there are, uh, remember the autonomic nervous system has uh, two motor neurons 
and the impulse is carried from synapse to synapse and in between those little gaps right in the neurons where the synapse occurs remember the um, we talked about the, the nodes of Ranvier and how the impulse jumps over those little gaps and the way that it jumps over the gaps is with the help of something called a neurotransmitter right and a neurotransmitter has to be present for that to happen there are two divisions remember of the autonomic nervous system and that's the sympathetic portion and the parasympathetic portion the sympathetic portion is our fight or flight portion and that's where our adrenal glands uh, come to the aid of our rescue like a bear is attacking us and an alarm goes off in the amygdala of our brain that we should get ready to flee or fight and uh, so that uh, we refer to that as adrenergic uh, which is um, a term that means activated by adrenaline so when you hear adrenergic, you want to think of the sympathetic portion of the nervous system, which is that fight or flight response. All right. Um, the adrenergic neurotransmitters um, are adrenaline um, and noradrenaline, and they are the ones that activate that portion of the nervous system. Now the parasympathetic nervous system is kind of the opposite. It's supposed to bring things back to homeostasis. Think about after you eat the big turkey dinner, right? And you're just kind of loungy couch potato. That is the parasympathetic nervous system at its best, all right? And it's referred to as cholinergic. Cholinergic means that it's activated by acetylcholine which is a neurotransmitter all right and this neurotransmitter activates uh, acetylcholine that is the neurotransmitter that activates the parasympathetic portion of the nervous uh, uh, autonomic nervous system right now auto, autonom um, uh, autonomic agents are available in oral forms and parenteral forms and uh, so we're going to talk about uh, four different categories and um, each one kind of uh, is the opposite of the other right so we're going to talk about adrenergics and adrenergic blockers and then we'll talk about cholinergics and cholinergic blockers all right so adrenergics are going to act like adrenaline so if you think about getting a shot of adrenaline right the heart's pumping the palms are maybe sweating respirations are increasing so this is going to amp up things that are going on in the body right so adrenergics can cause uh, bronchodilation stimulate the heart increase blood flow to skeletal muscles um, cause the pupils to di dilate, which is called um, madriasis. Remember that, madriasis? Um, and then also cause constriction of peripheral vessels, right? Because our blood's really pumping now, right? Because we got some adrenaline on board, all right? So um, examples of adrenergics are um, ephedrine, epinephrine, dopamine, uh, metaraminol, and norepinephrine uh, and so some of those are super common uh, in the operating room levofed um, epi is super common uh, in the operating room as well now let's think about adrenergic blockers so if we said adrenergics are going to give us like an adrenaline rush then adrenergic blockers must do the opposite right uh, it only makes sense uh, so there's two types of um, adrenergic blockers, or they refer to them as antagonists or sympatholytics. Remember, it's the sympathetic nervous system, that's our fight or flight. So um, it's breaking down that, um, uh, that uh, rush, right, of adrenaline that gets us all amped up. So two types, alpha blockers and beta blockers. Alpha blockers um, relax smooth muscle and they target the bladder neck 
um, and the prostate, and they can also act on the smooth muscle of the heart as well and help with the treatment of hypertension. All right, doxazosin, tamulosin, and terazosin are some common alpha blockers. And then beta blockers are ones that I have heard of more. I don't know about you guys, um, but they are um, primarily used to treat issues with the heart like hypertension and cardiac dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation um, or tachycardia and uh, they also help to lower the um, intraocular pressure of the eye and they also help to relieve angina and uh, so some common beta blockers are atenolol, metroprolol, and propranolol. All right, so moving on to cholinergics. Now, if um, we said that adrenergics are part of the sympathetic nervous system, adrenaline is released, fight or flight, cholinergics are related to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is bringing things back to homeostasis. We're coming, coming down off from our rush, all right? So um, cholinergics then are referred to as parasympa, parasympathomimetics, all right? Um, or muscarinics, and they mimic the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, if the adrenergics boost us up, the cholinergics are going to calm us down. So cholinergics are capable of slowing the heart, um, constricting the pupil, increasing um, gastrointestinal peristalsis, increasing production of secretions such as gastric juices, saliva, sweat, mucus, um, increasing contractibility of the bladder, um, and also the strength of the skeletal muscles, and then also decreasing intraocular pressure. Some examples of cholinergics are um, bethanicol, um, edrophonium, neostigmine, which is um, one that I had uh, on my CST exam was uh, asking about neostigmine, uh, and then that trade name is um, prostigmine. Um, and then pilocarpine is another one. Now let's talk about cholinergic blockers, all right? They're going to kind of be the flip side. They're going to block the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. So we refer to those as parasympatholytics, right? Um, their job is to do the opposite of the cholinergics. So where cholinergics increased gastric juices and, and uh, production of mucus, saliva, sweat, the cholinergic blockers are going to do the opposite. And, um, you know, um, cholinergic blockers are really common um, in surgery. The anesthesiologist or anesthesia care provider will give them to kind of dry up all the secretions um, so that it helps with uh, uh, reducing contents in the stomach um, and those kinds of things. So um, it is something co uh, common uh, that they might give. So again, that's going to decrease peristalsis, so less activity of the GI tract, um, dilation of pupils, and then it's going to relax the bladder as well. And so a really common example um, is atropine, which is definitely used in the operating room. Um, I've heard that um, name mentioned several times. Glycopyrrolate, um, propanthaline, and then our scopalamine is also really common. Okay, so let's talk about blood replacement interventions. Now, blood can be uh, autologous, homologous, or non-blood replacements such as colloid expanders. And so we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So um, intraoperatively, um, there could be blood loss. And uh, if we can anticipate that, we might suggest that the patient donate some of his or her own blood prior to surgery. And uh, when you're donating your own blood and getting that blood back, that is referred to as autologous blood. 
Um, it is preferred over other blood products because it is your own. So there's no worry of incompatibility or um, disease transmission or anything like that. Um, there are some situations when it can't be used, like if the individual has a fever or an infection or they're on some sort of blood thinning or anticoagulants, um, if they are taking antibiotics, if cancer is present, um, those sorts of things. Um, but um, like I said, if, if, if we can anticipate that there might be blood loss, then they might ask the patient to um, give some of their own blood preoperatively so that it can be given back to them uh, on an as-needed basis. Now, intraoperatively, blood can also be collected, and one common way that this happens is through something called the cell saver. And the cell saver is an actual machine and a special suction tubing gets hooked to it. And uh, we want to make sure as search techs, if we are using the cell saver, that we only use that suction tubing to suction up blood. We would have a regular suction tubing that we would use to suction irrigation that they use to clean and rinse the wound. But for the cell saver, we don't want any of that irrigation in there. We would just suction up the blood and that blood would be um, uh, collected in a container and some anticoagulant agents would be added to that and then it can be given back to the patient at a later time and post-operatively um, they can do the same thing typically four six eight ten hours um, I'm not sure honestly post-operatively they can continue to collect any blood that is um, collected into um, the from the wound um, into a special drainage system. And again, they can anticoagulate that and give it back to the patient. So that's a common thing. Uh, donated blood products are referred to as homologous blood. Um, homologous meaning coming from the same species, but from a different person. So these are the products that, that our patients would get from the blood bank. All right. Um, it can include whole blood, which means there's nothing that's been removed from it. Um, it can also uh, be just red blood cells, platelets or plasma or different uh, parts of the plasma, those coagulation factors or proteins. Um, to reduce the chance of some sort of hemolytic reaction, uh, they will do a type and cross on the patient if that is possible. Now, um, in an emergency situation, um, and they don't have time to talk, type and cross, they could give O negative. And O negative is the blood that is referred to as the universal um, blood donor. And then AB positive is referred to as the universal blood recipient. It can, the AB positive individuals can take any type of blood. Um, and then O negative blood could be given to any individual with any type of blood. If uh, certain blood types mix that aren't compatible, that's when that hemolytic reaction can occur. Um, it may, uh, the, the patient may experience symptoms right away or it could be uh, delayed for several days, but some symptoms to look for would be reddening of the skin, fever, chills, dizziness, fainting, blood in the urine, um, can also lead to respiratory distress, kidney failure, shock, and could potentially lead to death if treatment isn't um, carried out immediately. So anytime any, uh, you know, there would be uh, some symptoms like this would be noticed, then they would want to discontinue that blood right away and um, make sure that they treat accordingly. That's why that top type and cross is so important. And the American Association of Blood Banks, the AABB, uh, they're the ones that are responsible for setting the standards uh, for collection, processing, storage, and transfusion of blood. Now, whole blood, as I mentioned, is um, the blood that has not had any portions of it removed. And this is good for patients that have significant blood loss. 
Um, it's going to help restore the blood volume quickly and also assist with maintaining blood pressure and replacing the lost blood components. Now, um, different from whole blood therapy would be component therapy, and that means that somebody is going to get a component of the blood. Now, that could be um, red blood cells or what we sometimes call packed cells. It could also be plasma um, that they're receiving without the cells. There are also portions of the blood, like those clotting factors that I talked about, or plasma proteins um, that can also be derived from the blood and given um, separately uh, to the individual. And then lastly, those non-blood replacements uh, that I talked about, like colloid plasma expanders. Um, these are going to consist of um, proteins like albumin um, or dextran, also hydrox, um, hydroxethyl starch or HEDA starch. Um, there are um, also uh, gelatins that can be used. And colloids um, are too large to pass through the capillaries, to diffuse out of the capillaries. And that's good because it will help to um, keep the volume of the plasma at a level that maintains a good pressure. Okay, let's talk about cardiovascular agents. Cardiovascular agents um, act on the heart and the vessels. Okay, so they affect the heart and the vessels. And what they are used for is correcting some heart rhythm abnormalities or um, dysrhythmias, we say, um, by changing the speed at which electrical impulses move through the heart. Remember, we talked about that electrical system from the SA node to the AV node to the Purkinje fibers um, and so on and so forth. And so um, this um, cardiovascular agents are going to affect that pathway uh, that the electrical impulse travels along. Um, and uh, they refer to those as dromotropic um, and then uh, they can also be used to increase or decrease the heart rate, which is referred to as chronotropic. And then they can also be used to um, change the force of the contraction of the heart, which is enotropic effect. Um, and then lastly, they can help control blood pressure, whether it's too high or too low, um, they can be used to uh, correct that as well. And typically they come in oral and parenteral forms. Um, so there's uh, five categories that we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one is anti-dysrhythmic. Now remember, again, um, uh, arrhythmia or dysrhythmia are the same thing. They can be used interchangeably. And anti-dysrhythmics are going to be used to act on these abnormal um, uh, heart rhythms, okay, Other arrhythmias or dysrhythmias. And there are four classifications of anti-dysrhythmics. The first one is class one, and class one is responsible for blocking sodium channels. And by doing that, remember sodium is an integral component um, for the um, that allows the electrical impulse to jump from neuron to neuron. Remember the sodium collects along the cell um, and then it, um, as the electrical impulse passes across the surface, then sodium channels open and rush in. So if we are blocking some of those channels, then we are lengthening the amount of time that it is going to take for that impulse to travel from the SA to the AV to the Purkinje um, to stimulate the atria and the ventricles to contract. And there are several types of sodium channel blockers um, that the book talks about. 
Class two are referred to as beta blockers or also beta adrenergic blockers. Remember, adrenergic is uh, associated with adrenaline or fight or flight response. And so if they're blocking that, then that is going to slow the heart rate, right? Um, because um, adrenaline pumps us up. So if we're blocking that, it's going to calm us down. So it's going to slow the heart rate and reduce the effects of the influences from our sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight um, system. Right. Um, the way that it does this is it blocks certain neurotransmitters like epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, it can be used to relieve hypotension, angina, um, and some common beta blockers. I think we mentioned before atenolol, um, metropolol, and propranolol. Class three are referred to as potassium channel blockers. Remember, potassium is also needed to um, allow that impulse to travel from neuron to neuron. So by blocking uh, those potassium channels, it is going to slow the electrical impulse as well. And it's going to increase the time between the beats of the heart. Class four are uh, calcium channel blockers. Again, calcium is another thing that is needed for those electrical impulses to occur um, and, uh, and uh, therefore contractions of the atria and the ventricle. So calcium channel blockers are specifically used to reduce the force um, of each heartbeat. So um, that's going to um, decrease the heart's need for oxygen and nutrients. Um, it's going to help to correct dysrhythmias. And it's also useful in decreasing blood pressure in those individuals that have hypertension um, or um, are experiencing some sort of angina. Some examples are diltiazem and verapamil. Uh, and then the book also lists some miscellaneous ones like adenosine and um, talks about some nutritional supplements like magnesium and potassium. Now, coronary dilators are those that can be used to relieve chest pain um, and angina. And how it, uh, angina is caused by narrowing of those coronary arteries. Now, think about it. The coronary arteries, the job is to deliver blood to the heart muscle, and that blood is carrying the oxygen and nutrients that that heart needs to function. So if that is being reduced, then that is what is going to cause the angina because now the heart is struggling to work because it doesn't have the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs. So there are two types of coronary dilators, nitrate and non-nitrate drugs, and um, they're used to cause uh, the vessels, the coronary arteries to dilate or expand and get bigger. That's going to increase the lumen. It's going to increase the, the um, uh, the diameter right of those coronary arteries and it's going to help restore blood flow to the heart so that it can get the oxygen and nutrients that it needs this is also going to reduce the resistance on the wall of the vessel which is going to result in lowering the blood pressure all right which can uh, help to prevent a heart attack Right, and it can also help to reduce platelet aggregation. Remember, aggregation means the clumping together. So uh, hopefully reducing blood clots there as well. Um, coronary dilators are available in topical forms and the topical form would be uh, placed underneath the tongue or sublingual. Um, there's also other uh, oral medications and then injections that can be taken as well. So you might have heard of um, nitrate um, medications like nitrostat and nitrobid. Um, 
the uh, uh, or you might have heard of nitroglycerin, right? It goes under the tongue, helps to decrease blood pressure or chest pain. Uh, now, non-nitrate coronary dilators affect the smaller coronary arteries. And some examples of those are dipridromol um, and papaverin. And papaverin is a, a fairly common uh, injectable drug that we use in vascular surgery, peripheral vascular surgery, and uh, it gets injected right into the wall of the vessel. So let's say we're doing a carotid endarterectomy, which is um, opening up the carotid artery that is in the neck and kind of cleaning out the plaque there. Um, the surgeon could potentially inject perpaverin just to relax that vessel wall, because remember, anytime we cut into anything, it's going to get mad at us. And uh, when they make that incision into the wall of the um, carotid artery, it's going to want to uh, uh, instinctively contract down. And so the papaverin will help to relax the vessel wall. Now let's talk about entropics. Entropics are agents that are used to change the force of contraction. And here we're specifically talking about uh, Mr. Hart, or Mrs. Hart, as it were. Um, now, entropics, um, because they change the force of the contraction, can either increase it or decrease it. All right. Examples of those that um, Uh, examples of those medications that can change the contractile force are um, digop digoxin and digitoxin, um, and uh, those are examples of positive enotropic agents. So they're going to increase the contraction of the heart. And then beta blockers such as propranolol and uh, Versepamil, and um, yeah, so I guess those are the two that the book um, talks about. Those are going to um, uh, fall under the category of negative inotropic agents, and those are going to reduce the contractile force of the heart. Now, vasopressors and, and um, peripheral vasodilators um, constrict the muscles, um, well, vasopressors are going to constrict the muscles of the blood vessel wall, and that's going to cause the lumen to narrow. Now, when would we want that? If you said when the patient has low blood pressure, then you would be absolutely right, because causing the vessels to contract down is going to increase the resistance on the wall of the vessel and that is going to lead to an increase in blood pressure. Vasopressors are available in oral and parenteral forms and um, a common one that I've heard used in the operating room is phenylephrine or neosinephrine, very common one. Um, and then the flip side is a vasodilator. So vasopressors are going to um, cause constriction of the vessel and vasodilators are going to cause relaxation of the vessel wall. And when would we want this then? Well, we would want this if the patient has hypertension, right? Because um, relaxing that vessel wall is going to decrease the resistance of the pressure on the wall of the vessel, and that's going to help decrease our patient's blood pressure, right? Peripheral vasodilators are available in topical oral and parenteral forms, and some examples are um, cyclandolate, uh, and nilidrin and papaverin, our friend papaverin that we talked about when we talked about coronary dilators. Uh, lastly, our antihypertensive, anti meaning against and hypertension meaning high blood pressure. So these guys are gonna be used to fight high blood pressure, all right? Um, according to the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, high blood pressure uh, or pressure is considered high 
um, if it is at or above 140 over 90. Okay, so um, antihypertensives are going to help to bring it back down closer to that 120 over 80 mark. All right, um, and there are a variety of them. There's alpha blockers um, as well as angiotensins. Uh, there's beta blockers, those calcium channel blockers. There's also diuretics. Um, and remember, diuretics work by um, reducing blood volume. So when we use a diuretic, um, there is going to be more fluid filtered out by the kidney, uh, the kidneys, and that is going to reduce pressure because we're re reducing volume of the blood. Therefore, we're reducing the resistance of the pressure against the vessel wall, right? There's also nervous system inhibitors um, as well as those vasodilators that we talked about. Okay, next we're going to talk about central nervous system stimulants, and there's two types that the book talks about. The first type is amphetamines, and the second is analeptics. Now, central nervous system stimulants are used to stimulate the central nervous system, and uh, amphetamines have the highest potential for abuse. Uh, you may have heard of methamphetamines and cocaine. Those are two examples of amphetamines. Now, uh, methamphetamines are a class one narcotic and there is no current accepted medical use, but cocaine is a class two uh, narcotic, which is currently accepted for medical use. And we use 4% topical cocaine. It is in a liquid. It comes in a small little vial. Um, and it's maybe like 5 mLs or something, but we'll use that in nasal surgery and we'll soak some cottonoids, some little sponges in the, um, the liquid cocaine and then the doctor will go ahead and pack the nose with that. And so that's going to help with bleeding and it's also going to give a little bit of pain control. Um, psychotropic drugs are also... Um, a type of amphetamine, and they are used to increase wakefulness and concentration and sense of well-being. There are some amphetamines such as benzophetamine and phentermine that are appetite suppressants and promote weight loss. Ephedrine is also an example that is a vasoconstrictor. And then there are some medications in this category that are used uh, for individuals that have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And uh, Ritalin is a common one that you might have heard of. Um, the way that Ritalin works is that it accelerates the release of dopamine in the body, which is a, or in the brain rather, I guess that's part of the body, uh, which is a neurotransmitter. Um, it gives that feeling of happiness and euphoria, and um, this allows those individuals with ADHD to uh, be able to focus uh, better for longer periods of time. And then analeptics. Analeptics are drugs that are used following opiate-induced respiratory depression. Um, and this is common with anesthesia, right? Because the drugs that the anesthesia care provider give suppresses the respiratory system, especially when we're talking about general anesthesia, right? The patient can't breathe on their own at all. And so these medications are going to be given in these situations to um, go ahead and stimulate the respiratory center within the brain stem. And uh, so this often um, also increases wakefulness and blood pressure as well. Sometimes they also give it in cases of narcolepsy and neonatal uh, apnea. They are available in oral, rectal, and parenteral forms. And some examples include doxapram and aminophylline. Next on our list is 
um, coagulants or hemostatic agents, and there are so many different ones um, that we use in the operating room. Um, Remember, coagulants are used to promote clotting. They're also used as antagonists for a patient that has been anticoagulated. So their job is to control bleeding from trauma or surgery, and they come in a variety of flavors, if you will. Um, so I put a few images here on the slide for you. Um, and the first uh, one we're going to talk about is gel foam, and I apologize that these are a little bit out of order, but it's that uh, second image that looks like a piece of foam, um, and this is a type of absorbable gelatin. Gel foam is an example, but there's also other types like flow seal and surge foam. Um, some of these are uh, take a little bit more assembly and preparation um, uh, as the role of the surge tech, but the gel foam is just a piece of foam. They come in different sizes, and um, this can be applied right to the site where there is bleeding. It could also come in a powder. It could come in a liquid. Um, aluminum sulfate is also um, another type. I do not have an image of that one, but it can be applied topically in powder or gel foam. Um, uh, amino caproic acid, which is one I haven't used before, um, but this one can be given to hemophiliacs uh, up to 24 hours postoperatively to enhance clotting, probably um, the anesthesia care provider is going to be the one that's giving that or the physician is going to be ordering that. Um, another common one is this first image that you see here and this is bone wax. So bone wax is literally beeswax and um, if you ever had braces and they gave you wax to put on your braces, it's the same stuff. Uh, this has been processed so that it is sterile and it can be used to apply directly to the bleeding edges of bones. It, the body does see it as a foreign body, so they're going to use this rather sparingly. Um, the, you can see a small little white rectangle that's actually the wax, and uh, it's very pliable. So what we'll do is surge check is we'll kind of take it in our hands and just massage it a little bit to kind of get it warm and pliable and then take make us take a small little piece and make a ball out of it and put it on the end of an instrument called for your elevator and then the surgeon's going to use that to kind of apply it to the bone uh, when it comes back to you it'll probably look like most of it is still there um, they do use it sparingly uh, another common one is the, the third image from the left that you see on the bottom of the slide is a collagen coagulant called Avatine. There are also other types, D-stat, Instastat, and Helistat. This comes from cows, so it's a bovine origin, and it is applied topically. It can be in this... Um, kind of strange powder form. It can also be in a sheet or a sponge or a spray. And the way that it works is that it attracts platelets, which causes that platelet plug to form and coagulation ensues from that. Um, epinephrine, we've already talked about. That's a common one. It's not a coagulant, but it is a vasoconstrictor. And we talked about how that can help us intraoperatively. Fibrin-based glues such as Tisil and BioGlue and VivoStat um, are used topically and usually there's a couple, uh, uh, one or two syringes of uh, different medications that we have to draw up and prepare on the field so it comes in a little kit. Um, and then another one is um, kind of on the, the right middle of the slide is oxidized cellulose, and a, a trade name for this one is Surgicel, or Surgicel Nunit, which is the one that is in this image here. 
and um, it can also be directly applied to the area that is bleeding. Uh, other uh, agents that may be used are various polymers um, and then protamine is also another one um, that is an antagonist for heparin. Remember heparin is an anticoagulant. And we've also talked about silver nitrate. Silver nitrate sticks look like a matchstick. Um, if they're cervical bleeding or something like that, they use them for that. And then another common one that we will use in surgery is thrombin. And thrombin also um, can be made from bovine human plasma or recombinant DNA. And usually, uh, my, my experience has been in surgery that when we get our liquid thrombin on the field, we will typically take a piece of gel foam cut up like little one inch squares and soak the gel foam in the thrombin. This is uh, what's typically done for vascular procedures. Um, and then there's a couple other ones listed here, um, tranexamic acid, and then also vitamin K. Vitamin K, remember, is a component that is needed for clotting. Um, and it can act as an antagonist against warfarin uh, that is administered systemically. Individuals can take this in oral form as well. All right, now let's talk about contrast media. Contrast media is used during radiographic studies such as um, angiograms or Perhaps they are looking at the biliary tree during a uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, the, the term contrast media and dye are often used uh, interchangeably. Um, however, uh, usually a dye has some sort of color added to it that's going to um, give a color to the dye. But basically what contrast media is doing is giving this dark coloring to a structure that otherwise would not be visible on x-ray. So it's making those tubes or pathways what we call radiopaque. Okay, now uh, that is our positive contrast media. And typically, positive contrast medias are um, contain iodine or barium, and this is going to show light gray on an x-ray image. Now, it's important if we have a patient that has an iodine allergy that we avoid using the typical contrast media. Um, also, in individuals that have issues with their kidneys, uh, contrast media is typically contraindicated. Um, some brand names of contrast dye include um, Basilray, which is used on blood vessels, and Urographin. Uh, you might also see Renographin used as well. Sometimes when we're doing cystoscopies, they will also use contrast dye to light up the ureter and the kidney. And um, it's common, at least in my experience, that the urologist may want you to dilute it 50-50 with normal saline prior to uh, the use of that. Now there's also negative contrast media and it's radiolucent. And what that means is that allows x-rays to pass through it and it shows as dark gray on an x-ray image. Um, so some examples could be radioactive isotopes. I actually had some issues with my hip a couple years after my hip replacement and so I actually had a study 
a, uh, they used a radioactive isotope, they injected that intravenously, and it is uh, designed to target the surface of bones, and then they were able to take x-rays of my hip and get a good look at like if my implant was seated well and all of those things. So this could be um, another type of contrast study that a patient has not typically performed in the OR, at least that hasn't been my experience. Now diuretics, remember diuretics are going to increase the amount of urine excreted. Um, so um, this, remember, uh, if you remember back to anatomy and physiology, um, this um, increases the amount of water and salt that is excreted because reabsorption of sodium and chloride are decreased. So remember, water follows salt, and that's how diuretics typically work. Um, they can be taken orally or parenterally, um, but they're typically used to treat um, edema, which is swelling, as well as congestive heart failure or ascites that's caused by um, cirrhosis of the liver or uh, malignancy or cancer of the liver. Also, if a patient has hypertension, can be used to treat this because remember, um, diuretics are going to decrease the blood volume. And decreasing blood volume is going to decrease the amount of fluid or the blood volume that is pressing against the side of the vessels, which is going to reduce blood pressure, all right? Um, thiazide diuretics uh, impede the absorption of sodium and chloride in the distal part of the nephron. Um, and, um, some evidence shows that they also uh, do that same thing in the ascending loop of Henle. So if you uh, remember back to A and P, uh, uh, the structure of the nephron. Uh, so um, potassium sparing diuretics are also another example. They block the exchange of sodium and potassium in the distal tubule, um, so they retain potassium. And they are um, considered a replacement for thiazide diuretics when dietary modifications to replace potassium uh, isn't working well. And so they will go ahead and prescribe those instead. Now examples of thiazide diuretics include chlorothiazide and endopyamide. And then potassium sparing diuretics include um, amylaride and spironolactone. All right, let's look at a couple of dyes and stains. Dyes, oh, so there is a difference. So let's differentiate between the two. Dyes provide short time coloration. They're easily removed and they're commonly used in the surgical environment. You can see this example here uh, in the image. And stains last longer and or are permanent and they are typically used in uh, pathology and histology settings. Um, some examples of dyes that are used in the surgical environment, really common ones, gentian violet and methylene blue, and um, uh, the marking pins that we use, um, this is typically uh, what they are made of. There's also liquid, um, uh, it comes in a vial and we can also get that on our field. I've seen, you know, these types of dyes used to determine patency of some sort of tubular structure, whether it's bowel or a fallopian tube or a vessel. Um, stains are primary used in the histology lab setting, like I said. They can be used to identify the cell wall, and those are some of the ones that we talked about in microbiology, like crystal violet, 
fuchsin, and safranin. Now, different emergency type drugs um, are used for a variety of reasons, whether it is the uh, development of malignant hyperthermia, various allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions, cardiac arrest or respiratory distress or arrest. Uh, malignant hyperthermia, in the treatment of that, we typically see dantrolene is used. Um, the signs associated with malignant hyperthermia, of course, increased temperature, but also increased CO2 output. Um, so if those two things are identified, then, um, you know, we use ice. And then dantrolene is kind of this orange powder. It gets reconstituted and can be injected. Um, some of the anesthetic agents that are given have a can have a tendency to trigger malignant hyperthermia. Um, and if, uh, if the patient or the family has a history of malignant hyperthermia, they can either um, treat uh, preoperatively with dantrolene or they can use other types of anesthetic agents. Uh, when they are giving their, their various anesthesia drugs. Now, let's talk a little bit about allergic reactions. Allergic reactions, remember, they cause a histamine reaction. Um, and so um, a patient experiencing an allergic reaction, may uh, you may see flushing or redness of the skin, so that's something to look for. Also, swelling. If you notice anything like this in the patient, you need to verbalize that immediately. Could also, um, the patient could also have difficulty breathing, um, complain of a tightness in their chest, you may hear wheezing. As far as the central nervous system, they may, they may be confused or dizzy or complain of a headache or vision disturbances. From a cardiovascular perspective, they may again say that they have chest pain, they're experiencing dizziness or fainting, uh, their blood pressure might drop as well, and we might see tachycardia in addition to that with a really weak pulse. Now the GI system, uh, what's going on there? They might complain of pain in their abdomen, it might be distended, they might also be experiencing um, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. And if allergic reactions go untreated, that could um, result in a variety of complications, including uh, death if they're not treated. Um, so there are various things that we can do. Flushing the wound, if it's something of that sort, or flushing the GI system. Um, the anesthesia care provider would give some sort of antihistamine, such as Benadryl. Adrenaline may be something that's given as well. Uh, corticosteroids may be something else uh, that could be uh, provided. Now, if it's cardiac arrest, we're talking about adrenaline, lidocaine, nitroglycerin. Um, there's a variety of medications that are commonly given during cardiac emergencies. Um, in addition, could be aspirin or atropine, calcium chloride, dopamine, magnesium sulfate or mor morphine. They may also give vasopressors like we've talked about. Uh, so a lot of different cardiovascular medications that they might give. As far as respiratory distress, there may be neuromuscular blockers that are given, like succedylcholine. Um, that's going to cause relaxation uh, because remember, if the um, if the bronchioles or bronchi are spasming, they're constricting down and tightening. That's why it could be difficult to breathe. Um, there could be wheezing, and so they're going to give something to relax 
um, the respiratory system, bronchodilators are also included there and there are a variety of them um, that you can look over in the text. Emetics. Emetics are drugs that induce vomiting or emesis. Now why would we want to induce the emptying of the stomach? Well, typically that's because there's been some sort of an overdose of a drug or some sort of poison has been inject ingested. Um, direct emetics are administered orally and act directly on the stomach. Um, some examples are um, Epicax and alum. Indirect emetics are administered through injection or parenterally, and they act on the central nervous system to stimulate vomiting. An example is um, apomorphine, and uh, that one, again, um, acts indirectly uh, through the central nervous system. Uh, gastric agents. Gastric agents uh, are going to do something to the stomach, right? They produce an effect on the stomach, whether that is reducing or eliminating nausea or vomiting, like an anti-emetic, inducing vomiting, like emetics. We've talked about both of those already. Maybe we want to increase gastric motility or decrease gastric motility, um, either of those things. And then also to control acidity, um, such as with H2 receptor blockers. H2 receptor blockers are going to decrease or suppress the secretion of hydrochloric acid. Remember, hydrochloric acid is produced in the stomach and that can lead too much um, of a good thing, can lead to ulcers um, uh, and inflammation, that sort of thing. Um, some examples of those are uh, cimetidine or tagamin, you might have heard of, or um, feminitidine and rantididine, which is Zantac. So tagamin and Zantac are are two uh, common ones that you probably heard of. All right, hormones are used to regulate various body functions and there are a variety of, ex of types. Uh, the first type is corticosteroid and corticosteroids are produced naturally in the, in the, the center or the cortex of the adrenal gland and they're also available in pharmaceutical preparations as well. And those are divided into three groups, and those include glucocorticoids, such as betamethasone and dexamethasone, prednisone, um, and uh, triamcinolone, which Kenalog is, is a common one that I've seen used in the operating room as well. Mineral corticoids function in regulating electrolyte and water balance, and aldosterone is a major uh, mineral corticoid hormone, and it's available um, in a uh, drug form as well called uh, Florineth. And then there are sex hormones. That's the third type of corticosteroid, um, like testosterone and estrogen. All right, now insulin and glucagon, those are um, used to treat um, issues with the islet of Langerhans. Remember, there's those um, alpha cells and beta cells, and they secrete insulin and glucagon, all right? Insulin is produced by the beta cells, and its primary job is to lower blood sugar, right? So it latches on, <clears throat> excuse me, to the sugar that is free floating in our blood and it helps to turn it into glycogen uh, so that it can either be stored in the liver or used to um, uh, feed our cells. And then glucagon does the opposite. Glucagon is going to tell the liver to break down glycogen because more sugar is needed. 
Now, prostaglandins are hormone-like chemical messengers. They're secreted by um, cells. And remember, prostaglandins, um, they don't travel through the, um, uh, the vascular system great distances. They're produced in the tissues and they just act nearby. And so there is a variety of those um, <clears throat> that are listed in the text um, that um, can either help to cause uh, bronchiodilation, restrict gas gastric acid formation, help with um, vasodilation, stimulate blood vessel constriction, or and or protect blood vessels from clot formation. Lastly, sex hormones are um, secreted from the ovaries in the female and from the testes in the male. And um, like I said before, the female sex hormones are estrogen and progesterone. And some um, top uh, estrogens are available in a variety of forms, including topical, oral, and parenteral forms. And there's a variety of brands of them including Divigel, Estraderm, Premarin, um, which is one that I'm most familiar with, and um, then Progesterone. Um, there are brands like Crinone, Endometrin, Progest, and then sex hormones uh, for the male, like I said, are t is testosterone, and it is also available, several brand names of testosterone are available as well. All right, so inhalation agents. Um, oxygen is mentioned as an inhalation agent, although it is not considered a medication, but it is one of the most common things that we use as an inhalant in surgery. So it's mentioned here, uh, nitrous oxide is another example of an inhalation agent that is a gas, but inhalant agents are gases or vapors that are breathed in or blown into the lungs. And um, of course, oxygen and nitrous oxide are gases. Nitrous oxide is a um, is the only true gas that's commonly administered to induce and maintain general anesthesia. Um, and sometimes it's referred to as laughing gas. So if you've been to the dentist to have some work done and they've given you some laughing gas, this is what they're talking about, this ni uh, nitrous oxide. Um, so there are other inhalants that are used in surgery, but typically these are anesthetic agents and they're referred to as volatile liquids. And the anesthesia machine has a special um, contraption called a vaporizer and this helps to turn that liquid anesthetic in, uh, more quickly into a gas that can be inhaled. And so there are some common ones that are used in surgery, which include dasefluorane, influorane, halothane, isofluorine, and sevofluorine. Um, in addition to inhalation agents, um, there are a variety of nasal sprays that can be used as well. And um, nasal sprays are good for a couple reasons. One, um, there's a lot of capillaries inside the nose and they're really superficial in the mucous membranes there. And so it's a quick way to get something into the bloodstream. It also bypasses the digestive tract. Um, and this can be good if we're trying to avoid that hepatic first pass metabolism, right? If something runs through um, the, the GI tract, then it's going to go through that um, hepatic portal system first, and part of it's going to get filtered out before it even gets to uh, where it's going. So um, uh, nasal sprays are good for those reasons. Um, maybe you've used um, different nasal sprays before, like Flonase. There's a variety of ones for colds and allergy treatments that can be bought over the counter, but they can also come in prescription form as well. Um, there are a variety of other different types of nasal sprays that can be uh, can be used, and some of those um, include analgesics, anti-convulsants, anti-emetics, anti-psychotics, glucagon, uh, various immunizations, and insulin, 
um, narcotic antagonists, sedatives, topical anesthetics, vaso and vasoconstrictors for treatments of epistaxis, which remember is a nosebleed. So next we're going to talk about irrigating solutions. Remember the term irrigation is used to describe the act of washing, flushing, or moistening with fluid. And uh, sometimes they might also use the term lavage, um, especially in conjunction with like flushing out the stomach, which would be called gastric lavage. Um, but in surgery, we typically use irrigation intraoperatively at the field to wash out the wound, um, whether that's to, um, you know, remove blood or fragments or debris um, from the wound or body cavities, hollow organs. Um, this is going to improve visibility. Um, we also use it to flush out various medical devices like catheters and tubes and drains. Um, it's uh, sometimes irrigation is also used prophylactically to help diagnose or to help dissect tissue. And a common um, example of this is irrigation solutions that are used to distend a joint or a cavity um, and or to provide treatment. So examples like um, any type of arthroscopy, like knee arthroscopy, shoulder arthroscopy, ankle, wrist arthroscopies, we all, um, they all use continuous irrigation inside the joint, which helps expand the joint. Um, continuous irrigation is also used for cystoscopy and hysteroscopy as well. Um, there are a variety of different types of irrigation solutions that are used, and some have electrolytes in them, and they're considered electrolytic, and there are others that don't have electrolytes in them, and they're considered non-electrolytic. Glycine is a, is a good example of a non-electrolytic solution that we use in surgery. And this is significant because we don't want to be using any type of electrocautery in a fluid that is electrolytic because that means it's going to carry the current um, throughout that fluid and that could cause damage um, to the space where we're working. Um, so these types of fluids are good for those endoscopic procedures like I mentioned, like arthroscopies, uh, cystoscopies, and hysteroscopies. Um, there are also various antiseptics that you're already familiar with, like chlorhexidine gluconate, um, uh, betadine or iodophore, and also um, hydrogen peroxide and sodium hypochlorite, which is um, bleach. Um, sometimes in surgery we do use sterile water. Um, predominantly we use sterile water to rinse and soak our instrumentation. We remember we want to avoid um, rinsing any of our instruments in saline solution because saline has salt and that can damage the integrity of the surface of the instruments um, and cause pitting. Um, but remember when we did the breast biopsy and I was asking a few questions about why would we use sterile water uh, instead of saline. Remember saline is the most common type of irrigation and that's because the um, concentration of salt in saline is most like what is in and around our cells. And so um, you know, when we bathe tissues in saline, there's no movement of fluid in or out of the cell. It's kind of this nice balance. But with sterile water, that creates a hypotonic environment. And so that means the inside of the cell is going to be more salty. And so remember, water follows salt. So water is going to move into the cell, and that is going to cause the cell to burst or cell lysis. Times that we want this, perhaps, um, is when we suspect that there is some sort of cancer. Um, and then surgeons might, uh, their preference might be to use that. Uh, another irrigation solution that's used in the operating room is lactated ringers. Um, it is a transparent 
isotonic solution um, and it is uh, really good for doing arthroscopies because the composition of it is really close to that of synovial fluid. Remember the synovial fluid is produced by the bursa, these little fluffy fat pads that are in the joint. Um, they're lined with synovial um, membranes and those synovial membranes produce the lubricant or the oil that helps keep our joints um, oiled and, and moving freely. Um, another example of an irrigation solution is cardioplegic solution. This is a special uh, cocktail of solutions, if you will, that um, is used to temporarily arrest the function of the heart. So it's like this very cold, icy, slushy solution that they're going to pour right into the chest cavity that is going to make the heart stop beating while they're working on it. Um, and then lastly, dextran. Dextran um, is used in abdominal pelvic surgeries and sometimes laparoscopies, um, which helps to reduce ad adhesion formation. Um, I have never seen them wash the belly or, uh, with dextran. Now, um, somebody else that's had different experiences and might have seen that, but I have not witnessed that personally in the time that I've been doing this. Um, it's important to note that other things might be added to the irrigations that we are using. Um, antibiotics are... Um, commonly added to saline. They might add bacitracin or ANSEF or something like that. Um, it might also, let's say we have a patient that has an infected wound and they're bringing them in to wash that out and kind of clean away the devitalized tissue. Um, and we may use um, a fair amount of irrigation to clean that out. Uh, antibiotics might be added to that too. And then the other thing I can think of is like um, even when we're doing um, like liposuction, with liposuction they use something called tumescence. And tumescence is saline and then the a big bag of like three liters of saline, IV saline, um, and the nurse will add epinephrine um, and maybe some lidocaine to that and the surgeon's going to inject that prior to um, uh, doing the liposuction. However, there there is a distinction between irrigation and IV fluids, and we're going to talk about IV fluids coming up next, but it's important to remember that, that irrigation solutions like the glycine, the sterile water, the sterile saline, the lactated ringers, those are not for intravenous use. Those are just for topical use alone. Okay, so let's move on and talk about IV fluids. IV, uh, remember, stands for intravenous, and these fluids consist of crystalloids, blood, blood products, and colloids. Remember, um, colloids are those that are going to expand the volume. They're... Um, uh, the molecules of colloids are too big to slip through the membrane of the capillary, and so they're going to help to increase blood volume. Um, and then crystalloids are made from substances that form crystals, such as salt uh, and sugar. And uh, they're the primary fluids used uh, for IV therapy. Um, so IV therapy is going to be used um, as a result of trauma, surgery, dehydration, um, due to like vomiting, sweating, diarrhea, those kinds of things, um, or if somebody doesn't have the ability to take fluids by mouth. So intraoperatively, uh, for the most part, uh, all of our patients come to the operating room with an IV that helps to keep them hydrated intraoperatively, and it also allows the anesthesia care provider to administer medications more easily and directly into the uh, cardiovascular system. Now crystalloid solutions are available in three different what they call tonicities. And um, remember we talked about isotonic, 
hypotonic and hypertonic in our anatomy and physiology classes. And so that's what they're referring to when they say tonicities. So iso, hypo, and hyper. Remember, isotonic is meaning equal, equal parts of whatever, salt, let's say, on both sides of the membrane, inside the cell and outside the cell. Hypotonic means there's going to be less parts outside of the cell Again, that's going to mean that there's more salt inside the cell. Water follows salt. Water is going to move inside the cell, and that's going to cause the cell to swell uh, or uh, burst or lice. Um, and then the third one is hypertonic. That means there's more salt outside the cell than inside the cell. Again, water is going to follow salt, so water is going to leave the cell, and that's going to cause the cell to shrink. And uh, that term that we use for that uh, is called crenation. And so um, a variety of isotonic uh, crystalloid solutions do exist, and one uh, we are very familiar with, which is normal saline. Um, for 0.9% sodium chloride, it only contains water and salt. And then there's lactated ringers, which we a lot of times in the field call LR. And LR contains calcium, chloride, potassium, sodium, and lactate, um, which is an alkalizing agent. And that helps to correct acidosis. Remember, that's going to be a really low pH, pH that's too low. Um, is um, acidic. Uh, so uh, Ringer solution has uh, the same electrolytes as LR, but there is no lactate. Uh, that's why it's called Ringer's and not lactated Ringer's. And then 5% dextrose, which is a sugar in water. That's going to help to uh, maintain those um, uh, blood sugar levels. Now, hypotonic crystalloid solutions are used in patients that have too high of a sodium level. If they already have too much sodium, you don't want to give them more. So you're going to use an IV solution that has a lower salt concentration. And they do make um, crystalloid solutions that are like 0.45% uh, saline or 0.225% sodium chloride. So uh, half normal percent uh, half normal and quarter normal is what they call them. And then if we have somebody that has a low, uh, too low of sodium, then we can give hypertonic crystalloid solutions. Um, there is a 5% dextrose in normal saline, so we have sugar and salt. Um, there's also higher, per, um, higher percentage concentrations of saline, like 1.8%, 3%, 7%. 7.5% and 10%. Um, you know, and this this list is by no means um, all inclusive. There are a variety of different types of IV fluids, and they come in a variety of different concentrations and different things in them. Um, but these are some of the most common ones you'll find. Various lubricants are also used in surgery, and actually right now during our DNCs, we are using KY jelly as a lubricant. So we already understand that, you know, um, when we're working in areas um, that have mucous membranes, we want to lubricate our instruments to make sure that we don't damage the integrity of those membranes. And so water-soluble lubricants like KY Jelly and Surgilube um, are a couple um, different lubricants that are used. There's also anesthetic um uh, lubricants as well. Like there's a xylocaine jelly and that can come in different percentages as well. Um, Vaseline and mineral oil are also a couple different petroleum-based lubricants. Some of the um, non-adherent dressings that we have are impregnated with Vaseline. Uh, mineral oil is commonly used when we're doing some type of split thickness skin graft, which helps the, um, the dermatome just slide nicely along the skin so that we get a, a, a good, a, a solid, 
a piece of uh, skin graft for us to use. Uh, there are also um, ophthalmic um, agents that are also, um, you know, in different types of ointments and things like that and jellies. Um, but uh, those types of medications that are used for eyes are specifically for ophthalmic use and the other lubricant should not be used um, in their place. Narcotic antagonists are used to reverse analgesic, hypotensive, respiratory, depressant, and sedative effects of narcotics, which are the opiate opioid. Um, and uh, some examples of narcotic antagonists, a very common one that is frequently used in the operating room is Narcan, but there are others listed um, in the text that you can look at as well. Now, narcotic analgesics are derived from the poppy plant. And if they are derived from that natural source of the poppy plant, then they're referred to as opiates. And if they are developed synthetically, like in the lab, then um, they're referred to as opioid, uh, which makes sense because in medical terminology, remember OID, uh, oid means resembling. Right, So those that are made from some synthetic sources are going to be resembling those that were made from the natural sources, like the opiates. Um, those come in enteral, parenteral, and topical forms, and they're used to increase tolerance to pain or decrease the reaction to pain, but they can also be used as cough suppressants, um, and they... Uh, also decrease intestinal motility. That's why a lot of times when individuals are taking narcotics for a long period of time, the physician will also suggest that the patient take some sort of laxative because it can um, lead to constipation as well. Um, some, uh, um, some examples of common narcotics that are used in the operating room are the Schedule II narcotics, and those include alfentanil, fentanyl, meperidine, morphine, uh, and sufentanil. Those are some common ones. Um, now, when we use narcotics in the healthcare setting, there are state laws and guidelines that um, dictate how the disposal of narcotics should go. So if, um, you know, morphine is um, uh, what the surgeon is going to want to use or the anesthesiologist is going to give the patient some morphine and there's five mLs in a bottle and only two are used, then the other three have to be disposed of somehow. Um, and this is usually a two-person system. Um, a lot of operating rooms now, probably most of them, have systems called PIXA systems, which are kind of like drug vending machines um, where uh, the nurse put or um, care provider puts in their special password and what medication they use and how many they're going to get out and a little drawer pops open and they get that out. Um, if it's not used, then it has to be returned. But um, if... Uh, it's just a partial vial that's not used, then that has to be wasted. And typically two people have to sign and witness the wasting of a narcotic. All right, next let's talk about obstetrical agents. Obstetrical agents are used for a variety of reasons, whether it is inducing abortion, stimulating and suppressing lactation, stimulating or relaxing uterine contractions, or preventing hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, drugs that induce a lactation and stimulate increased milk production are called galactagogues, which I'm pretty sure that that's a Star Wars thing. Um, and then um, there's also antiemetics like Regolin that's commonly used. And then there's other drugs that suppress lactation called um, cabergoline. And uh, uh, 
something you've probably heard of or remember hearing of as we talked about it in anatomy and physiology is oxytocin. And remember, oxytocin is the natural hormone that is released to stimulate labor. Um, and so that is going to stimulate the uterus to contract and hopefully push out baby. Um, but sometimes um, synthetic oxytocin um, is given, and that is called pitocin. Uh, another uh, drug you might remember is Rogam. Uh, we talked about Rogam when we talked about erythroblastosis fatalis. Remember, this is a situation that can occur if you have a mom with a negative RH factor and baby has positive RH factor. Now, um, around the third trimester and uh, during birth, the baby, the mother's blood is exposed to the baby's blood and vice versa. And if mom is negative and baby's positive, then mom's blood is going to build up antibodies to attack the positive antigen that the baby carries on the blood. So it, it doesn't cause erythroblastosis um, fatalis with baby one but it will with subsequent pregnancies. So Rogam is typically given in these situations. It is an immune globulin and it's manufactured from human blood and it contains that positive RH uh, factor antibody. And because the mom's body senses that the antibodies are already there, it will not make additional antibodies and therefore it will not attack baby um, if it does have that um, positive RH factor. As I said before, there are a variety of ophthalmic agents and these are a lot similar to drugs that are used elsewhere in the body that we've already talked about. However, ophthalmic agents are going to have a verbiage on the label that says that they are specifically intended for ophthalmic use. So you want to make sure that it has that. Like let's say you're pulling some sort of ointment um, some antibiotic ointment. You want to make sure that that label says that it is for ophthalmic use because those have um, special buffers in them to make them more compatible with the eye. Various sedatives and hypnotics are also used in the operating room. Um, these are central nervous system depressants and they are typically classified as narcotics. Some of them are also referred to as um, anxiolytics, which means they help to reduce anxiety and produce a more calm um, feeling. Um, hypnotics as well um, are often referred to as saporophics, um, and these are used to induce sleep. And the way they do that is by um, inhibiting a neurotransmitter that's called gamma amino butyric acid or GABA, G-A-B-A. -A. So this slows down the effects of the, ner the central nervous system, reduces anxiety, and helps to produce sleep. Um, barbiturates such as phenobarbital um, can be used to control seizures. Um, and some other barbiturates such as theopental sodium or sodium penthol um, is uh, a common agent that is used to induce general anesthesia. Aside from that, benzodiazepines also have anti-convulsant, amnesic, uh, anxiolytic, and sedative effects, and they produce minimal cardiac and respiratory depression. So these are often used during something called like a local MEC. And local MAC means that the individual isn't going to be under general anesthesia. Instead, they are going to have a local, like a numbing medicine, injected at the surgical site. 
and then the MAC, M-A-C, stands for Monitored Anesthesia Care. All right, so they're going to kind of be napping and snoozing, um, and some common um, medications, uh, benzodiazepines they use during local max are diazepam, droperidol, lorazepam, and midazolam, which we've talked about before. And then those reversal agents that are commonly used are, um, uh, the generic would be, be uh, flum, flumazenil, which is um, mazicon, aromazicon. Um, to use to reverse the effects of those benzodiazepines. Vagal blockers are going to be those that block the effects of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, one of its jobs is to tell the stomach to produce hydrochloric acid. Um, so vagal blockers um, help to reduce the production of um, uh, hydrochloric acid, as well as various other um, cholinergic um, responses. And uh, then, then um, some examples would be um, uh, some H2 receptor blockers, such as anticholinergics, parasympatholytics and those anti-muscarinics, which we covered earlier on in this lecture, um, if you can remember that long ago. Uh, vasodilators, we've also talked about, um, but vasodilators are going to be used to relax the vessel wall. This is going to reduce pressure and increase the blood flow. Um, these may be used to target coronary vessels. Remember, the coronary vessels supply the muscle of our heart. Um, and there are some examples listed there for you. Vasoconstrictors, on the other hand, those are the opposite. Those are going to be used to constrict vessel walls. This is going to increase resistance, which means it's going to raise up blood pressure. And some examples um, are ephedrine, metaraminol, and petrescin.